All right, so I'm just gonna get started here. So today we are talking about what really matters when we are trying to choose a partner and what doesn't matter, what isn't important. Because a lot of times when we've gone through toxic relationships or we've been with people who are emotionally unavailable, it can be really confusing to try to figure out when we go back out there and start dating, what is actually important? What are the things we need to be looking for? Lots of people are sending and talking about different things that, that, need, that we need to pay attention to, but not very many people have done the actual research. So what we're gonna talk about today is the actual relationship research. People who have looked into relationships in the long term and talked to people and said, okay, well, what, what actually is working here? What makes for long-term relationship happiness? Oh, thank you guys for leaving comments. Okay, we're good. So I recently read the book, How to Not Die Alone by Logan Uri, who is, well, she was a behavioral scientist who then turned into a dating coach because she found the area of relationships and dating so interesting. And so I'm basically going to give you a summary of what she talked about in the book and what the latest relationship research is saying leads to long-term happiness. And I was actually quite surprised. It's not what I thought. And I think many of you guys might be surprised here too at what the research shows is actually what we wanna look for in a long-term relationship, for long-term happiness, not just a short-term fling or a, a, a momentary dating situation. So before we do that though, I'm actually curious, what do you guys think is important for long-term happiness in a relationship. Drop some comments here, and I'm gonna read them out loud because I'm curious to what you think. And I'm also gonna try to share a little bit of experience from what I'm going through currently with, with my partner and the things that are working and what kind of got me to the place where I realized that this relationship was actually, or excuse me, that this research was actually correct. It was working for me in my own life. So yeah, let me know what you think in the comments. And I'm gonna share what I used to think was important when looking for a partner. I thought that attractiveness was really, really important. I thought that finding someone who had the capability to make a, a decent amount of money was really important. And I also thought that someone's ability to be faithful and loyal was very important. So yeah, I'm curious, Conchetta is saying mutual respect. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, so a lot of times we, we come into dating with these preconceived ideas of what we think is important. Like maybe we even have a checklist of all the things that our partner should have, and sometimes they actually are not really all that important. So Marlon is saying good communication. Yeah, so these are really great things. So. I'm gonna start talking first about what does not matter when it comes to choosing a partner. The first thing that the research found that was actually not very important when it came to choosing a partner was money. I know, right? <laughs> Shock, it's kind of shocking, it was shocking to me. The research shows that there is no increased satisfaction or happiness above $70,000 of income. So what this means is that it doesn't mean that you have to like completely ignore someone's financial status. You know, we, we want them to have a job, of course, or have some sort of income. But what this research shows is that we don't need to be looking for someone who makes excessive amounts of money in order to be happy. More than 70000 no noticeable increase in satisfaction. So that's one of the things that actually doesn't really matter when we're looking at long-term relationship happiness. And I know th this, this was actually shocking to me when I first learned about it because there's so much talk about there, so much talk out there about getting people who are ultra ultra wealthy or ultra ambitious and they need to be making over 100k that's that's the goal for a lot of women but 
Unfortunately, the research has shown that that's not actually what makes for long-term happiness. Um, guys, as I'm reading these, please drop your comments. What do you think? I'm very curious to, as to what you think about some of this research. So another thing that does not really matter when it comes to long-term relationship happiness, according to the research, is attractiveness. <laughs> so now I'm going to also explain this a little bit. This does not mean that you can just go out there and be with someone who you aren't attracted to. That's not what this means. What this means is that, according to the research, lust eventually fades. It always does. So you do not need to find the most attractive person out there or the person who just drives you crazy sexually. That's not actually what leads to long-term happiness. All that really matters is that you find this person attractive. There's just something about this person that you really like that draws you to them. They don't have to be the best looking person out there, but as long as you find them somewhat attractive, you're good. So that's another thing. If you have on your checklist that this person has to be really attractive in order for you to be happy, you can let it go. It's actually not proven to be an indicator for long-term relationship happiness. So Conchetta is saying, yeah, money has not been a big factor to me. Yeah, that's great. So you're, you're right on track there. Again, it doesn't mean that we're going to completely overlook that aspect. We do want to have someone that has some financial stability. That is really important for a lot of people. But excessive amounts of money, mm -mm, not necessary. So Marlon is saying income needs to be comparable to mine or maybe a little less but I like to do things that cost. Okay, yeah, Marlon, so if that is really important to you, maybe that is something that you have on your list of must-haves. And just know that the, that the research has shown that when it comes to long-term happiness, it's not that big of a deal, but I understand that for many people, it is really important. So, thank you guys for, for commenting here. Another thing that the research has shown that is actually not that important when it comes to long-term relationship happiness is being with someone who has a similar personality as you. <laughs> this one made me laugh because a lot of times when we go out there and date, we kind of subconsciously try to date someone who's very similar to us. Not always, sometimes we go for the opposite, but sometimes we, we, we think of, okay, well, who, who do I want in a partner? And we compile this list in our minds and they actually end up looking pretty much exactly like we do. And we think that that's necessary to have a really healthy relationship. But again, the research has shown that that's really not that important when it comes to long-term relationship happiness. It doesn't mean that you need to be with someone completely your opposite, but what the research is showing is it doesn't matter if you guys aren't exactly the same. If you have some of these qualities that I'm going to be talking about at the end here, then it's okay. You don't need to find someone who is exactly like you. The last thing I'm going to talk about here that is not important when it comes to long-term relationship happiness is having shared hobbies. This one was shocking to me too. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? We don't have to like the same things? We don't have to en enjoy doing the same things together? No. <laughs> the research has shown that no, that's actually not that important. You don't have to like to play golf like your partner does. Your partner does not have to like to shop or cook in order to be happy in the long term. What really matters is that your partner supports your interest or that you support the interests of your partner. So what wouldn't work is if your partner's really into golf and you were constantly bugging him about that or saying, why are, why are you playing golf all the time? That's just so silly. Or vice versa, if you're really into hiking or cooking and your partner was like, why are you going hiking all the time? That's, that's so silly, that's so dumb, stop doing that. That's when it really doesn't work. So, 
Are you guys curious for what is really important? Let me know, let me know in the comments or give me a heart, give me a like. I'm gonna talk now about what is actually important according to the research for long-term relationship happiness. So what's the first thing that's really important? Emotional stability and kindness. Oop, am I chopping up here? No, I think we're okay. <laughs> Emotional stability and kindness. So what this means is you want to look for someone who is pretty even keeled emotionally. Now, this doesn't mean that they don't have any emotions, but it means that they can keep them in check. It means that if you upset them, they're not gonna fly off the, off the handle and, and lash out at you or verbally attack you. That wouldn't be healthy. That would be a toxic relationship. So emotional stability just means that someone does indeed have emotions, but they keep them under control. If they're angry, they take some time away from you and they work through that anger. They don't take it out on you. If they're upset, again, they take that time to process that emotion and then they can talk about it in a healthy way. That's what is important for long-term happiness. Kindness goes hand in hand with that. We wanna look for a partner who isn't lashing out at every little thing that happens. They respect you and they understand that they need to treat you kindly and they're not going to be lashing out at you left and right. Again, this emotional stability piece does not mean that your partner doesn't have emotions. It just means they're able to handle them and keep them in check. So is this making sense so far, you guys? I'm just curious, let me, let me know as I'm going along here. So that's something that has proven to be an indicator for long-term relationship happiness. If your partner isn't able to do these things, the outlook doesn't look good. So keep that in mind as you're going out there and dating. The next thing that the research has shown to be really important for long-term relationship happiness is loyalty. This one's kind of like a duh. Like when I read this, I was like, yeah, obviously. <laughs> but sometimes we forget that. And this doesn't always have to show up as somebody cheating on you. This could be like if you have a partner who just likes to gossip or does these little betrayals behind your back that can tend to add up over time. That is not loyalty. So what we wanna look for for long-term happiness is loyalty. Loyalty over some of the things that I talked about that weren't as important, like a really high level of physical attract attractiveness or making a lot of money. Loyalty was shown to be one of the things that successful long-term relationships had. Oh good, so this is making sense to you. Thank you, Conchetta, perfect, perfect, okay. The next thing that the, that the relationship research showed to be really important for long-term happiness was your partner having a growth mindset. I have found this to be crucial in finding a partner who was really a great match for me. I was with partners who really were not interested in growing. And that was a big problem because we're not perfect here. So many of us have a lot of our own healing to do. So many of us have really not had great examples of what healthy relationships look like. We really don't know how to communicate well. We need to learn how to, how to resolve conflict in a healthy way. And so if you have a partner who isn't willing to do that, who isn't willing to do the hard work of learning those skills and working to be the best version of themselves that they can be, the research has shown that this does not lead to long-term happiness. And I can share with you, again, more about my own story here. When I met my partner, we were not this like perfect match for each other. We had a lot of things in common, and I made sure that, that this person had the most important qualities that I had on my list, and one of the ones that was up there was a growth mindset. So again, we weren't perfect for each other. We were a little bit mismatched in our communication styles. We were a little bit mismatched in our, what would you call it, like our, our physical compatibility. But both of us were willing to grow. We were willing to 
learn what the other needed. We were willing to learn what worked for the other person and that has resulted in a really amazing relationship. And we're, we're still working on it to this day. It's actually really fun and enjoyable for us to just tweak it, to, to fine tune some of the, the things that we're experiencing. So that it, I have found personally to be really, really important in finding a partner. Because what can happen out there, and, and this was true for me in the past, was we have this list, we, we know exactly what we're looking for, especially after we've been in a lot of bad relationships, but then we go out there and we're trying to find a partner who is perfect from the get-go, where everything matches up perfectly, there's nothing to work on, and that's pretty much near impossible. The most important things to look for, again, are these, are the ability to grow and to adapt your behavior in order to make it work for the other person and vice versa. Yeah, Cassie's saying it's encouraging to hear that communication and conflict resolution are things that can be worked on and fine tuned. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, some, the, the reality is sometimes you do meet someone who has all those things down pat, but very frequently they don't. And this is something that I had to work on personally myself. I didn't have it all down pat from the get go. And when you're in a different, each relationship you're in, the, the things that the other person needs are different. Everyone's not the same. So you have to sometimes modify your own ways of being and, and communicating and resolving conflict to work for the other person. And they have to do the same for you. So if, this, so if the person that you're looking to be in a relationship with has this growth mindset, if they are able to adapt their behavior to you, that is a really great sign. That is what the research has showed is really important for long-term happiness. So the next thing that is important to long-term happiness, and it, it actually dovetails with what I was just talking about, is the skills to fight well, the skills to resolve conflict in a healthy way. This again, doesn't mean that this person has to have all the skills from the get-go, but are they willing to learn? Are they willing to do the hard work? Can they learn those skills and then put them into action when it matters? You may not know this from the get-go with someone. You may have to date them for a while and see what happens when conflict comes up. But this has been proven to be a really good indicator of long-term happiness. If you're with someone who has no desire to learn how to resolve conflict in a healthy way or simply just can't do it. A lot of narcissistic people just can't do it. They are unable to resolve conflict in a healthy way. There's too much going on for them internally. It's not possible. That's not going to be a healthy relationship long term. So if actually, if you guys want a recommendation for a great book to learn how to resolve conflict in a healthy way and how to improve your communication, message me, I'll, I'll send you the link for that. But there's lots of ways that you can learn how to do this and it's so, so important for having a healthy relationship. It's, for me personally, it's really been one of the most important things to, to see that I could actually resolve conflict in a healthy way with someone because there's going to be conflict in a healthy relationship. It's, it's inevitable. There's going to be hurt feelings and disagreements. It just happens. But if you can talk about it in a healthy way and resolve that conflict in a healthy way, that is what's most important. So if someone isn't able to do this or isn't willing to do this, not a good sign. It's not gonna be a healthy, happy relationship long-term. So I see a question here, Cassie's saying, Lindsay, my ex-husband didn't lash out. Instead, he just went along and didn't say anything until he would eventually just explode. I would be caught off guard because he'd eventually erupt and I had no idea something was even bothering him. Is that another side of the same emo emotional instability coin? Yeah, you know, Cassie, this is something really important to bring up here because I had a similar situation with my ex-husband. It was, it was deceiving for me at first because my ex-husband was very emotionally stable. He didn't have a lot of access to his emotions. He was also emotionally unavailable. So we could give him, we could give your, your ex-husband and my ex-husband the, the, we could say, yeah, they were 
emotionally stable most of the time, except when exploding. I would say that that's not a sign of emotional stability. But it, that's not the only thing that you need to have a relationship work out and to be happy long term. So if they just have one of these things, not, not that great. Because remember, along with emotional stability also came kindness. So I don't think that it's very kind to keep everything within and to not talk about things with your partner and to not be open about how you feel. So just because your partner has maybe one of these things, that's really not enough for a relationship to be healthy. And yeah, Cassie, I would say that, that this, what you described here, that is definitely emotional unavailability and that's not going to be great for a long-term relationship. That's not going to be that's not going to make you happy. It isn't exactly one of the things that I'm going to talk about here as to what the research has shown, but I would say that this that is not a healthy relationship if there is emotional unavailability present. So, I hope that's helpful. Sometimes that Sometimes emotional unavailability can look like emotional stability, and it is in a way, but again, it's not healthy if you're not expressing and you're not communicating. So I hope, I hope this makes sense here. And Carol says, yeah, she's had the same thing. Okay. So the next thing, well, this is actually the, the last thing. No, no, wait a minute. <laughs> I have two more. Sorry, guys. The next thing that the research has shown to be really, really important for long-term relationship happiness is the ability to make hard decisions with you. So what this means is when shit hits the fan, as it does, when things get challenging, because life is going to bring challenges, can this person talk about things and make decisions with you in a way that feels good? Or do they just kind of peace out emotionally and leave all of that heavy lifting, lifting to you? Do they just say, well, you know what, this is what we're going to do and this is what I want and too bad to what you want to do? That's not what we want. We want to be with someone who has the ability to make a decision with you together to where both of you feel good about the outcome. This was surprising to me. I didn't really think that this would be something that was so important. It wasn't even really on my radar as one of the things that I should be looking for when it came to a partner. But it came up. It came up as one of the most important things. And it makes sense. And, and it has now proven to be something that is really important for me in my, my personal relationship. As we've been together, I've watched us be able to make important decisions together. Like, where are we going to live? How are we going to divide the, the housework? Lots of things like that. And those hard decisions have always been pretty easy to do with this person. And that's what we're looking for. Oh, good. So, Cassie, I'm glad that was helpful. Yeah, so the research, again, has shown that if you are with a partner who you can make decisions with together, that is what's going to make that relationship happy in the long term. The last thing that I'm going to talk about here, and I think honestly this might be the most important thing, is how does this relationship make you feel? Big picture overall here. How do you feel when you're with this person? Do they bring out the best in you? That's what we want. We want to be with a person who it feels really good to be with. I can tell you that my previous relationships, I thought that I was really in love with these people and I was crazy about them. But did I feel like I was at my best around them? No, <laughs> no. Not at all. I actually felt really insecure. I felt really anxious. I didn't feel good being in a relationship with them overall. Now, if you had asked me at the time, Lindsay, how do you feel in this relationship? I would have said, oh, I'm so happy. I feel so great. But if I really thought about it, 
No, I actually was not at my best. I didn't feel supported. I didn't feel appreciated. I didn't really feel respected or loved. But now it's very different. I can honestly say that when I'm with my partner now, I do feel like I'm at my best. I feel very supported. I feel appreciated. I feel like the presence of my partner in my life is adding so much value to my life. Whereas before, that was not the case at all. So what does, what does this look like in, in real time here? What this looks like is that you might end up realizing that you feel really good around a person who maybe was not on your radar as far as what you thought you would like in a relationship. Maybe they don't have a ton of money. Maybe they're not the most attractive person, but you just feel so good being with them. That's what this looks like. <laughs> and I know this has happened to a couple of the, the women that I've worked with in my programs. And, and it was kind of true for myself as well. The person I'm with now, really, I would not have said that they were my type in the past, but just being with them felt so good that I really couldn't deny that, that this was a really good relationship. So yeah, Cassie's saying the same. I put them on a pedestal and loved being theirs. Yeah, but I didn't feel valued and I was often hurting and anxious. Things with my new partner are still in the early days, yes, but so far it feels like a team and an actual partnership, which is what I've always wanted. Yay! Cassie is one of the women that has gone through my program and I'm just so happy with everything that she's experiencing now. But that's what it's like. I I did a very similar thing. I, I, I was so proud to be theirs that oh this person had claimed me they chose me but yeah i was just miserable in those relationships if, if i if i was really honest with myself so what the what the relationship research has shown is that if you feel really good around that person that's a great indicator that this relationship will be good and happy for you in the long term so I am curious for you guys, what was the most surprising thing that I talked about here of what is actually really important for long-term happiness in a relationship? Let me know in the comments and then I'm going to talk about something else real quick. I'm going to talk about what this specifically means for us when we've had toxic relationships or abusive relationships or been with people who are emotionally unavailable. What does this mean? So. What this means is that we have to learn how to like the people who like us, who have all these healthy qualities. And let me just tell you from personal experience, this is not an easy thing to do. It's not at all. There's a reason why we ended up in these toxic or abusive relationships. There's a lot of subconscious stuff going on. There's a lot of addictive patterns that pull us to these partners, these partners can feel, these toxic partners can feel so compelling. So the goal here, when we are out of a toxic relationship and we're going back out there and meeting people is to learn, again, how to be open to the people who show up for us, who say, hey, I really like you. I wanna pursue things with you. Our, the goal is to open up to those people. Now, this doesn't mean you have to be, be dating every single person, but if someone is open to you and they're showing up and you can see that, okay, there is something attractive about them and I do feel good around them and they are showing all these qualities, that's the person that we want to at least consider opening up to and consider opening our hearts to them. So I've, I've talked about this in a lot of different videos. There's so many unconscious things going on that pull us to these partners. So it's definitely a transition to be open to a healthy partner, to someone who really can show up for us. And a huge part of doing this is rewiring our deeper subconscious beliefs. This is part of what I do in my program. It's, it's, it's just one of the many things that I do. But what I have found personally to be so helpful for being open to healthy love is to take a look at all of the things that I'm believing about myself, but also about relationships. 
one of the things that I personally was carrying around was the belief that I'm not good enough. And if I believe, or any of you believe that, that we're not good enough, we're not gonna be open to people who are healthy, who can show up for us and be good long-term relationship partners because it just doesn't, it doesn't click for us mentally. Because if we believe that we're not good enough and someone shows up and says, yeah, you're awesome, you are totally good enough, it's that cognitive dissonance. We don't like to be proven wrong, it's not familiar, it can actually feel really scary to let that love in when we believe, for example, that we're not good enough. So in order to get to the place where we can be open to these partners, it's really important to do the healing work. Otherwise, again, like this, all of this dating advice is just, you can just put it to the side because it's not, it's not gonna work unless you're doing this, this deeper healing work. And I, again, I say that from a lot of personal experience. So one of the things that we do in my Living Free Finding Love program is we shift these deeper subconscious beliefs so that you can be open to these healthy partners. And here's another thing too. If we have a lot of emotional baggage, we can end up being emotionally unavailable ourselves. And then we end up chasing the things like attractiveness and looking for a lot of money because they keep us emotionally safe. They keep us distant to be pursuing partners who are a little bit more cold or who don't treat us very kindly, but maybe their focus is on gaining wealth or they're, they're very, very attractive and that's their focus. They're going to the gym all the time. It's a way to keep us safe emotionally. So when we do the healing work to release our emotional baggage, this is another thing that I focus on really, really strongly in my program, then we ourselves can be emotionally unavailable. And we tend to value all of the things that I spoke about in earlier that are important for a healthy relationship. We tend to value those more than we did in the past. We start to look for the people who are kind, who are emotionally stable, who are loyal, things like that. So I hope this makes sense to you guys. If you find yourselves continuously attracted to people who don't treat you well, who are emotionally unavailable, who are narcissistic, please do reach out to me and I'll, I can tell you a little bit more about my, my Living Free Finding Love program. It is created for women who are ready to break these toxic relationship cycles and are done, 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 done with having bad relationships and are ready to have a real healthy relationship. So if you're interested in that, reach out to me, send me a message, or you can comment living free, finding love below, and I will reach out to you. All right, guys, this is the time. If you have any questions, if you have a situation you want me to just go over, if you want some perspective on, drop it in the comments here. And let me make sure there's nothing else that I wanted to share with you guys today. One of the things, as I'm, as I'm wrapping this up here, one of the things I just wanted to make clear in this broadcast today is that there is a good person out there for you. If you're struggling in dating and you feel like your only choices are the nice, the nice guy who isn't actually that nice after all, or the person who is just narcissistic and abusive, those are not your only options out there. It can feel like that when we haven't done a lot of that inner work yet, but I can tell you from experience, there's lots of really good partners out there. So there is hope. Again, if you're needing support, please reach out. Okay, let me just make sure I have not missed any of your questions or comments. Nikki, yes, I will absolutely send you the link. Okay, I don't think I missed any. I'm gonna just give this a minute here in case you guys have any, any more questions, but thank you so much for watching. And next week, I'm gonna be doing a Ask and Ask Me Anything Live. I do those at on the, the last Tuesday of every month. So if you have a specific question next week, save it for the live. It's gonna be really fun. Those are always one of my, my favorite broadcasts to do. So I don't see any questions here, so I'm gonna sign off. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this was helpful. And if you have a suggestion for a topic for me to do for another live, Put it in the comments here or send me a message and I will see what I can do as far as addressing that on one of my live broadcasts here. All right, guys, thanks so much. I will talk to you next week.